Hi everyone, Adam Steele from Hot Pulse Studios here, and today we're going to be checking out the S2V speakers from Adam Audio. Now these things are considered a serious upgrade from what I have behind me. I have used Adam A7s for as long as they have been released. Um, when I was a young man, I will tell you a story like a granddad, um, me and a lot of other music tech university students in the early 2000s went to a music store in Leeds, a big one, and they let us try, I think it was 10 sets of near field monitors and some of them sounded really great and some of them sounded really bad and one set to me just sounded exactly like what I wanted and that was the old Adam A7s. The bass wasn't woof 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 and overblown, the high end wasn't tinny and piercing but it was incredibly clear so I went with that and then years later the A7X came out and that's what's up there. Uh, now, since then, I have upgraded my system to have two subwoofers, so it's the Adam Sub 8, which makes it quite an expensive system. Now, since then, um, I always saw the Adam S series as the, like, the unattainable, ultra expensive, like the S5 is a big monster of a thing, and the S3H is also an absolute monster. And I always figured I couldn't fit those in the studio. And now they've come out with the S2 series and the S2V, standing for vertical. Uh, they're a little bit bigger size-wise than the A7X. And the question that I want to answer today is, what does it do that the A7X doesn't? How does it sound comparatively? And is it worth the extra money? So this is going to be a fairly in-depth kind of video considering that I'm not going to be able to show you too much of how the speakers sound. I'm going to try my best, but there's only so much I can show you because of the constraints of my room and the fact that you're listening to YouTube audio. Although I am going to do an audio test later in the video. So the timestamps are in the description. You can always skip ahead to that if that's what you're here for. Now, first of all, let's talk about the features that the S2V has. This is a loan model, a demo model that's been sent to me by Adam Audio to try. Uh, these are not mine to keep. These are, I'm not being paid for this video either. I just had a crazy idea and gave Adam Audio a call and was like, hey, I want to try these. They've got some features that are very interesting to me. Uh, firstly, this has AES in and out, which means that the audio can be sent to the S-series speakers digitally, uh, which means that the really nice RME converters that I have up there would be completely useless for these, but that's fine because then I could repurpose those converters for my second pair of monitors, which uh, you can see one of them over there. They're like a copy of the NS10s. Uh, if this all goes to plan, I think I'll put those on the outsides of these. Now, again, why would you want these? And one of my ideas is low-end response. Uh, the Adam A7Xs uh, are fairly well suited in terms of power for a small room. Uh, the lower driver, the seven-inch driver, has a 100-watt uh, power stage, and the tweeter has a 50-watt power section just for the tweeter which sounds like loads, and it, it, it is, but this isn't home system listening. This is monitoring, and the whole purpose of doing it with monitoring is that really you want the system to have way more power than it could possibly need so that if you've got any kind of drum hits or transients or anything, you know about it. They come out, they hit you, because the thing about... Uh, the thing about studio monitors that a lot of people don't realize is you, you're you using them in a way that home listening systems were never intended. A lot of the time, the sound that comes out of these monitors is going to be 
bad. It's going to be not compressed perfectly. It's going to be slightly unexpected. Um, we as mix engineers and recording engineers then use our tools to, to fix that and change that. But we need our speakers to be incredibly honest with us and not like compress on their own or saturate on their own and sound nice because if they sound nice and then we send things out for release and they send ho they sound horrible on other systems that's bad and that's our fault so what you want is a speaker that can absolutely blast whatever's not right at you so you are very aware very quickly and that's where these come in, because these have a far higher power rating, even though I'm not going to be turning them up any louder than the A7Xs. Uh, let's have a look. I think... I'm just going to do my research. Yeah, so the tweeter is exactly the same uh, power rating at 50 watts, although this one has a pretty cool kind of waveguide thing on there. Uh, but the uh, woofer itself has a 300 watt power section. Now, you're, like I said, you're not going to have to drive this louder than any other set of monitors, but it means if there is a transient or anything that comes through, the speaker isn't going to panic. It's not going to buckle. It's just going to deliver that to you. And as far as I'm aware, the low end extension on these is significantly lower than the a7x that's the reason that i got the subs in the first place is that i was feeling like the a7x is as honest as they could be from about 60 hertz upwards it says on paper they go lower but i wasn't feeling it i wasn't noticing things and when i got the subs suddenly i was very aware that some of the mixes i was doing had subharmonic content that was eating up headroom in a mix or causing issues or alternatively, I was mixing and the low end that should have been there wasn't there, but I couldn't tell. Now I'm hoping that these S2Vs will replace all of this. And furthermore, uh, that the low end extension on these means that the low end will be coming from in front of me rather than below. Now I have done videos before asking the question, can you feel where subsonic frequencies are coming from? And I did a semi kind of scientific test there. So there's a, a link in the card up there if that's what you're looking for. In my estimation, you definitely can tell where subsonic frequencies are coming from. And um, partly because of upper harmonics that are generated, which then give you the clues as to where something is. I mean, yes, maybe a 20 hertz sine wave with no other harmonics is hard to detect where it comes from, but in real life, that never happens. Although, of course, the perfectly made speaker uh, shouldn't do that. Also, it's got a USB connection on these. You can't send audio over USB. That's not what that's for. But there is some audio correction and tweaking stuff that you can do in the speaker. That's going to be very interesting because up until now, I've been using sonar works on my system here. And sometimes that's great. Sometimes that can be a bit of a pain, uh, especially if I'm switching between speaker setups because sonar works isn't really designed for that. You can do it, but it's really awkward. If I can have that kind of correction built into the speakers so that they can be adapted to my room because I know as well treated and as sound isolated as this room is, it's not perfect. There's a big curve in that wall there and that generates uh, quite a big kind of bass dip on one side, which is correctable. Uh, most of it, the, the sound in here is not too far off ideal for a control room. We did purpose build this. I mean, we've got floating walls, floating floors, floating ceilings. Before anyone says, looking behind me, oh, you've got foam, you don't know what you're talking about. That's the final step uh, for uh, high-end reflections that were occurring because of the, the corner shape on this side of the room. Uh, so that's uh, to stop flutters, but the rest of the sound in here is just about as good as it's going to get. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a very recent mix that I did through this setup with Sonarworks on, with Sonarworks off, and then without the subs. 
uh, without sonar works because I'm going to compare it to these and I'm going to use a pair of Austrian audio microphones, uh, the OC818 microphones, which are relatively linear, really nice sounding in a spaced pair quite far back in the room. So if you've got headphones at that point when you listen to that, uh, it'll give you some idea of the differences, even though it won't be perfect, you know. So let's get on with uh, changing out the speakers. Uh, so you're going to see this slightly out of order and get ourselves a bit of a demo. impression that's so much clearer without the subs uh, I think for my system I might still want to have one sub in uh, because the low end now is it, it probably drops off around the same point that 45 50 Hertz ish kind of thing and I just want the extension now but compared to the a7x's which when I really drove them loud were uh, starting to buckle a little i'm already noticing that this at above listening volume which is what i've been playing this at it's probably at a 95 to 100 db in this room um it's still totally clear totally clear um and that's without any correction without any sonar works type stuff so that's probably what i'm going to do now is I'm going to try sonar works with them and get myself a graph and then we're going to play with Adam Audio's own software and I'm going to switch them to AES. Well, uh, reaction time. I have just listened to my usual reference track which I use with uh, really impressive uh, new systems which is what you see in front of you, which is uh, Scary Monsters and Nice Sprites by Skrillex. Uh, the reason that I use this track is it's got a lot of low frequency content, a lot of mids. Uh, there's a lot of switching in this song between having a very mono source and then a very super wide stereo. And because it flicks backwards and forwards very often, uh, you can very quickly get a sense of whether a monitoring system is accurate, because if it isn't, the mono bits don't sound mono. They sound like they've got some sort of like space on them, but on the S2Vs, and I've not done sonar works yet, uh, the, uh, the mono bits are really coming at me from dead center, and they feel like they've got a lot more aggression and bite than on any other system that I've heard it on, and not in an EQ kind of way. It feels like the transients are all there and the accuracy is, well, that's what you pay the money for, right? So, let's do the sonar works thing now. Now that I know that's working. Uh, I've been using uh, gravity stands, by the way, which are really, really good. Uh, but the Austrian audios are currently on them. Now let's switch the system to 44.1. Uh, use the Arturia audio fuse because the preamps in that are super clean. And also it's got two XLR inputs on the front so I don't have to mess around with the patch bay and remember what's what because I'm going to redo all that fairly soon in this room. So there's a big bump at 80 hertz which is 
definitely the room. Big bump on the left at 800 hertz. Wow. Um, did not expect that. Uh, the 600 hertz dip there, that's a big dip as well. And then the high end is all relatively linear. Relatively. Uh, a couple of bumps here and there, but nothing huge. But yeah, note to self, 800 hertz on the uh, on the left. Hmm. Wonder what's causing such a big bump on that side. Anyway, that's that's no reflection on the speakers. That's a reflection on uh, on uh, my room, which uh, I'm going to do a little bit more work on, I suspect. But yeah, interesting that this side has a big 600 hertz dip. I did put some heavy mass traps back on the right hand side. I might need to move one of them over to the left. I think that might straighten them out. But again, for another time, save and finish. Okay, that's enough of that. I just thought I'd try a blast test and see how these handle uh, the kind of volumes where you would be shouting at each other. Again, uh, don't do this at home, guys. Uh, but I did find that it was handling it absolutely flawlessly, which you would expect at 700 watts handling per, you know, a pair of these. Now, let's just cut back to this camera. Now, I was going to show you the uh, software that comes with them, but it seems that I can't access it because I've not bought these speakers they are on loan. But I'll talk to the guys at Adam Audio. But from what I've heard... Cannot confirm nor deny, but at the time of filming this, there may be something coming out soon that uh, improves that experience anyway. So that's going to deserve a video in its own right. So that is all I have time for today. I've only just had these speakers. Well, I've put these in today. I have these on a four week loan. So impressions so far i'm very impressed uh in aes it sounds as good as it does in analog which is pleasantly surprising but then i'm using some really high-end rme converters when i do the analog mode i'm going to play around a bit over the next couple of weeks uh try having the subs in with the s2vs but maybe have the subs only boosting up to maybe 60 hertz maybe even 50 hertz just kind of thumping away just at the super low stuff that the S2Vs would never have done because they are two-way monitors and not three and they don't have massive drivers. There's no physical way to get super, super lows. So I may bolster it with them. As for is this set worth the money? It's a big price jump from a pair of A7Xs, that's for sure. Uh, at time of press, a pair of A7Xs is just under a thousand euros, whatever that in, is in dollars. And a pair of S2Vs is more than two and a half thousand dollars. It's a tough call. Now, something that my regular viewers have uh, said about uh, a video that I made very recently is I accidentally called something a fundable. And I'm going to go with that. So, let's talk about these. Uh, so, let's use a fundable as a scale where we say, like, one side is how fun something is to use and the other side is how affordable it is. Because, of course, then we can talk about the law of diminishing returns and then talk about who this is for. So, um, these are very, very fun to use. Um, like I said, I've now tested these with a good couple of tracks that I know very, very well. And they are incredibly clear. The top end on the track that I played comparing the tracks was a little bit piercing, but it turns out that's because I mixed it that way. Oops, my bad. Um, I had been trying out the Slate VSX. And yeah, turns out, 
I was a little bit pushy in the 2 to 3k region on that particular mix, which luckily for me, it was being sent off to Katie Tavini, the mastering engineer, who hopefully will have caught that and tamed that area down a little bit. Um, she's exceptional, so I would imagine that she would. Um, but uh, checking back the Skrillex mix, uh, that's just absolutely brilliant. The super lows aren't there. I'm talking at 40 hertz, 30 hertz, but then they never would be with two-way monitors. And uh, obviously the price is not affordable. These are like two and a half thousand pounds, euros, dollars plus tax, roughly. Uh, that's a lot. But if you're looking at a long-term investment and a lot of, you know, professional sound engineers, that's what we do. We don't buy gear like this with the intention of replacing it in six months. You buy a pair of speakers like this with the intention of them lasting you five years, ten years, more. And so if you're looking at that over time and you do this for a living, it's starting to sound like an attractive proposition. And for me, I've got, as you can see, my control room is not the smallest, which is great. Um, but that means that I probably want to bolster the low end a little bit, which a sub will do. Um, I'm not sure if I'll need two subs because these already handle quite a lot of low end. Uh, so I might have one sub with these and then pair the other sub with the NS10s. That way I've got two full range systems a near field and more like a midfield system i might even sit the s3 uh, the s bleh. i might even sit the s2vs a little further out and maybe a little further back and bring the desk forward a little and have them as midfield uh, because they can do that they can handle the levels uh, the the room is big enough for it uh, definitely not big enough for far field main monitors in here but so, yeah, all this rambling is to say that so far, I'm very impressed. And the only logical leaps up from here are something like something like the S3H, which is the three-way horizontal S-series 3 horizontal S3H. Uh, those are a lot larger and would definitely have to go at the sides of my console here. And those things are something like between five and eight hundred watts each. Those are some serious. And the price is the next jump up. We're talking five thousand euros, which is then the price of uh, a couple year old car. So we're we're talking not even close to disposable money at that point. For what for the price range, I'm gonna give them an eight out of ten. I definitely recommend them because the Adam SR tweeters are so clear, it's ridiculous. But you might want to budget in a sub as well. And at that point, that's getting close to the price of the S3s. Anyway, um, several weeks from now, uh, there will be a part two to this. And the part two is going to be when I talk about the software. And at the end of that video, I will tell you whether I decided to keep these or not. I may go back to the A7Xs. It'll be, probably be quite difficult to do, but then it'll be all about justifying the cost. So, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, find the part two if that's not, you know, if this, if this video has been out for over four weeks, then look for the part two, because then I'll be able to tell you. Uh, hit the like button, uh, subscribe to the channel so you see that part two video come out if it hasn't already. And look at the Patreon if you want to support us so we can do more videos like this. Thanks everybody for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye everyone. Hey everyone, that might be the end of the video, but if you fancy carrying on this conversation, we have a Discord server, link is in the description. We're also on Patreon, which is something you can really help us with. We also are on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Hop Pole Studios. See you there.